Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Chris, uh, and I got my friend Philip with me. Hey. Hi. And uh, yeah, today we like to talk about demystify into security technologies in firmware. Um, unfortunately, we are not able to uh, travel to the US, so uh, we have to actually do our our uh, recording here and and be there remotely. Um, all right. Um, yeah, demystifying into security technologies. Um, first of all, I'd like to give us like a, a short intro on who we are and, and what we're doing. Um, so we are both working at Nine Elements, right? Um, Nine Elements is the largest open source um, independent BIOS vendors, so IBV um, worldwide. Uh, we are more than 12, 13, 15 people now um, and only work with open source firmware. Um, we're actually driving the open source firmware community. Um, so we founded a, a, our own conferences. Uh, we are in the, in the leadership meetings of Core Boot, uh, Linux Boot, Tiana Core, and all the other firmware projects which are out there. We will not go into these uh, projects today, um, or not that much actually, um, but just so you know what our background is here. Basically. Um, <clears throat> yeah, what do we want to talk about today? Um, so today it's a little bit, yeah, it's a firmware talk, obviously, right? <laughs> um, and firmware, as you might know, and probably you know best, um, that firmware is quite blocked today, right? So there's like a lot of blobs and binaries all over the place. Um, and it's also NDA'd like a lot, right? So for everything that you that happens in firmware, like every security technology and also everything else, basically, um, you need an NDA with uh, one of the big SOC vendors um, to actually get documentation if there's any, uh, or to get tooling if there's any. Um, and yeah, as I said, firmware BIOS and UFI, is, it's, it's pretty blocked. Um, there are a lot of binaries. Um, to give you an example, um, like the normal x86, um, uh, x86 firmware right, that you have have nowadays. Uh, I mean, what what blobs do you have there? There's like a handful of CPU vendor blobs, um, like all these firmware support packages that you actually need to do all the memory in it, the silicon stuff, and so on. Um, there are also additional OEM and ODM blobs, uh, like for custom custom stuff that they actually put in there um, for um, for your graphics card and all these kind of things, right? Um, and all together, that's like if you have, I don't know, like a 16 MB firmware image, it's at least half of the images. Is, is, yeah, is at least right. uh, 10 megabytes, I would say. So on the modern platform at the moment. Yeah. So that's that's even more than half, right? It's yeah. 60%. But right. I mean, I already got my new uh, Lenovo X1 uh, Carbon Gen 9, and it already has inside the Linux six firmware blobs for initializing <laughs> audio <laughs> and video and yeah. whatever. Yeah. So it, it's like, it's really, it's really uh, not really nice. And so we're seeing more blobs uh, in no. the ecosystem. No. And actually, I mean, you have 10 MB of blobs, right? And the other 6 MB is closed source firmware, right? <laughs> so <laughs> like, yeah. everything is actually closed. Uh, however, the blobs are even, even, even more special, right? Yeah. Um, that's true. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, the other, the one thing is uh, we have firmware and, and all the blobs inside. And the other thing is, uh, thing is um, there's no real tooling, right, for all these kind of things. I mean, there is some tooling um, and also some open source tooling, yeah. some closed source tooling. Most of the closed source tooling is actually only run on Windows and these kind of things, right? Um, so there's no really open source tooling for, for these kind of things um, out there. And I think that is that is was one of our main um, um, main motivations here, actually, yeah. uh, to do what we did in the last two years. And also for transparent security audit, it's really important to have, um, let's say, open tooling or at least open documentation about those technologies, right? How do you an open and transparent security audit if if you don't know what's in there? So it's nearly impossible. Yeah, that's yeah. a huge problem, actually. <clears throat> I mean. Nowadays, um, if we look, um, I mean, we, in this talk actually now, we're concentrating on Intel, but not that AMD is much better on that part, but um, we're concentrating on Intel. Um, and there are so many security technologies in Intel, right? I mean, I know a handful, like out of, out of my mind, right? So like PFR, SGX, TDX, uh, there's Boot Guards, there's TXT, there's some CVT. Uh, what, what did I miss? 
uh, there's probably STM, right? Secure transfer. Oh monitor. yeah, yeah, right. It's it's. Uh, and yeah. there are also some hidden ones which are not public yet, so yeah. we can't disclose them. But mm -hmm. there are tons of of more inter-security technologies out there. Probably you had some in in. Uh, you had uh, some of uh, of them we currently have in the slides. But in in general, this is a, it's a really it's a jungle of IT security technologies. Yeah, and my, all of them have like fancy names, right? And you don't really know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the thing is, most of it, right? Uh, most of them are actually implemented in firmware, or if not any of these, right? So yeah. at least any of the ones that we named right now, um, you have either any binaries or structures. Um, or functionality yeah. and even if SGX, right? So secure uh, software guard extensions are basi basically um, um, uh, they have also firmware that most people don't know, but it's located inside the microcode. Mm -hmm. So even if you have like confidential computing technologies, they also need firmware. Probably the firmware code base is really small and it doesn't compare with which, uh, with other parts uh, parts of the system. But um, yeah, that's uh, it's really uh, yeah. Not yeah, and I think yeah, that's that's unknown to most of the people, right? So that that uh, you have so that that these security technology as rely so much on firmware, and even in, if you are an IBV as as we are, even then these parts are NDA, right? So we have to have special NDAs with the SOC vendors and so on to actually get proper documentation on these kind of things. And like to be honest, even with proper documentation, most of the time. I know it's try and error, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's the thing. Um, yeah. So what what does that mean, right? Um, so everything is implemented in firmware. Um, you're actually relying on 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 the OEM or ODM to that they know what they're doing, right? And that they that they provision your platform correctly, that they configure your platform correctly, and these kind of things. And and that is. Yeah, that's like a big risk here, right? Um, yeah, and also it's impossible to to get into that topic quite easily uh, if you're part of the Linux community, right? So, and yeah. there might be some public documentation now, but it's just high level. It's no details in it, and all the edge cases and problems with these technologies are not documented, and uh, so this is uh, really a problem. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. So, yeah. and that's that's where it all starts, basically. Right. So we will give now an intro to the Intel Converge Security strategy, let's say. Um, so Converge Security is um, basically the idea of uh, putting everything together, which basically means um, if you have security technology, it always has a core root of trust. Mm. And this core root of trust somehow um, can be shared between different security technologies, right? Mm -hmm. So, and even if you're a hardware vendor, it's really expensive to develop every, every new technology in a new stack. So it's probably a better idea to base it on one stack you have in control. And so we will talk about... I mean, some, yeah? It makes sense, right? Yeah. Bit, right? It at least makes sense that you say, okay, let's share some of these features across the different technologies that we have. That's true. Not really completely agree. Everything. It's also better for security, right? Because right. you only need to, to verify one, one um, core stack, let's say. In terms of security properties, no, yeah, but uh, let's say um, Intel started that, and they call it Converge Security Strategy. And at the moment, it includes boot guard technology. Mm -hmm. We come later to that. Explain it to you. Mm -hmm. The same for trusted execution technology and Intel PFR. Um, all those technologies are currently in there. I heard there will be more coming, which merge in. So they try to add more and more security technology or put it on top of their mm -hmm. core technology stack. Mm -hmm. And um, so we will see what happens in the future in the next generations. Yeah. But uh, this will definitely happen. Yeah, yeah I mean, BootGuard and, and uh, TXT, I think they're called con Converged BootGuard and TXT, right? So yeah. CBT, right? Yeah, but we will come later to that. So yeah, okay. we will, first we will explain basically the, the core technology concept. Mm -hmm. um, so we had con uh, this off. So basically, um, in the technology concept, we have four, uh, four things. So we have the Intel authenticated code modules. I mean, you may have, may, may have heard about this. It's some kind of block uh, which is doing all those security stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there's a CPU, which is really important in this case. Obviously. <laughs> a result would be bad. <laughs> Uh, the Intel Management Engine. So Intel Management Engine, for everyone who doesn't know what it is, it's basically the Southbridge firmware. Yeah. It's Southbridge firmware with benefits, I call it. Like the solid benefits. <laughs> yeah, benefits. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and we have firmware security headers. So we have some kind of headers around the BIOS or UFI firmware image. Mm -hmm. um, 
So first we will look into the ACM. So ACM are basically closed source binaries or firmware um, distributed by Intel. Um, they are basically written in assembly. I don't think they you see, right? So most of or biggest part of it is probably written in assembly. Yeah. There may, might be some C, maybe they use some C for yeah. it as well. There are parts of But they are really low level because um, they run before the memory is initialized inside the CPU cache. Yeah, and so, actually you don't have much there, right? So yeah. before you got DRAM, <laughs> there is yeah. like, you got the CPU cache basically, right? Yeah. And like there's a couple of things going on, but there's not much that you can actually do there. Yeah. Yeah, and the 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 uh, the nice thing is actually so before you so when you turn on your computer basically and before the x86 system uh, x86 firmware actually starts, uh, the CPU loads these ACMs right, so these authentic code modules into its own uh, let's call it RAM. I think they call it AC RAM, right? Yeah. So and they have like a special proposed RAM, or uh, I think they're using the cache basically for that, where they load the ACM into to execute that, right? Yeah. Um, but it gets verified. If I, so if I remember correctly, all ACMs have like a signature. Yeah. Um, and the the key to verify these ACMs, which is which is quite fancy, is actually in the CPU, right? So there are ACMs for dedicated CPUs, or they are yeah, every CPU basically has dedicated ACMs that you can run. Yeah, and uh, every CPU also, just for your info, um, has firmware itself. So CPU is not firmwareless. It's not a piece of hardware. It has also multiple firmware components in there. They're quite small, but they are there. Yeah. So it's really important. And another interesting thing is some of the Intel um, ACMs are um, encrypted. So I guess for BIOS guard, uh, they use an encrypted ACM to protect against reverse engineering, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. So it's some additional protection me mechanism. I don't know where the key comes from to decrypt it, but I think it comes also from the CPU. Not sure what they use there, but... Uh, you know what encryption they use? Though? No. Ah, okay. That yeah. would be interesting. Yeah, yeah, we can probably look into that. I mean, we have at least NDA level access. But um, it's uh, it's uh, it's kind of uh, let's say it's also hard to dig through those documents. Yeah. Anyway, and one thing to note also is you have different versions of ACMs, right? You can have like a debug uh, ACM, um, yeah, which can only run on uh, on on uh, pre-production hardware, right? Yes. So on at the OEM basically when they when they spin the first boards, uh, you got non-production worthy ACMs, which. <laughs> Kind of something in between, I don't know. Yeah, and you got the production with the ACMs, and all of the ACMs you only get under NDA, right? Yeah, that's correct. No. <clears throat> so what have we next? Um, we have the firmware security header. So um, there's uh, one header called FIT firmware interface table, mm -hmm. which is basically a CPU parsable data structure. So you need to know. Um, the ACMs we talked about are located inside the firmware image, mm -hmm. and you somehow need to load it, right? And the CPU doesn't know where it, where, where it is, so it maps in the beginning of, of, the, of the platform, bring up the CPU memory maps the entire, or let's say up to 60 megabytes of SPI flash, or so the BIOS flash, into, um, into, uh, at the reset factor of mm -hmm. the CPU, uh, and so CPU somehow needs to pass this fit to figure out where the ACM is. Mm -hmm. And so um, this is what fit does. It's, I guess it's all, there are already some documentation about it, or especially in the Cobwood project. Yeah, you there, probably can check it out. There's some nice graphic being included in the slides. You can see it's more like Cobwood based, but uh, you can see what kind of, um, um, let's say, offsets the fit is referring to. Yeah. And uh, it's a binary data format. So that's no common data format, just binary data format. And yeah. it's easy to, to pass for the CPU because the CPU doesn't have so much firmware, right? So it has not enough space probably to include an JSON pass. Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah, in, in the fit, uh, you can find uh, location of microcode updates, uh, you can find ACMs, um, and also the other um, firmware headers that you need, um, as we already mentioned, like KM and BPM and these kind of things, right? Um, which we'll explain probably in the next slides. Um, but all these kind of information, where to find those stuff, is actually located in that fit table. Yeah. Yeah. Another um, firmware security header is the key manifest. Um, so as, as the name already tells you, it's it's for key management. So it's the high level key hierarchy. Mm -hmm. manifest. Um, it's also passed by the ACM, so not by the CPU itself. If the ACM is loaded, the 
it, it will pass a key, a key manifest. Um, it contains a lot of hashes from public keys. Mm -hmm. So there are different kinds of security technologies, as we already mentioned, for the converged security strategy, um, which can be uh, validated um, through the key manifest. And um, yeah, the signature of the key manifest itself is verified through the hash of the public key, which is attached to the to the key manifest itself. So not not the hash, but the public key is attached. The hash is burned into fuses into the South Bridge, mm -hmm. so into Intel ME firmware. So basically, what they're doing is um, they move with that with their technology. Basically, what they do is they move the root of trust into the South Bridge, right? Because yeah. because they're fusing. Uh, the the hash of the public key in the ME, right? And that is like a one-time thing that you can actually do, right? So it's a one it's one way direction. Uh, you can fuse and cannot unfuse it again if it's in production. And then the ACM, which is signed by Intel and verified to the CPU, actually checks if that KM is a valid KM, if it has been like signed by a valid uh, by a valid key, right? Yeah. Um, and that's that's how they build up that root. Of trust, right? Uh, and before they used like different uh, root of trust technologies, like for I don't know legacy TXT, let's call it, right? They had, they had like TPM and these kind of things. But now what they did is uh, moved into the South Bridge and combined it with the CPU, right? So with their own silicon basically and started from there. Yeah. So it's also probably the more secure idea. It's probably not that, um, uh, let's say, uh, independent from Intel anymore. It's less open, I would say. Yeah, yeah less open, but it has a, probably the benefits that the Intel ME has some kind of hardware protection mechanisms, which are probably better than the TPM. Um, it's probably TEPA uh, ev evident instead of resistant, but I don't know. Um, I mean, either. I mean, TPMs are already like a hard catch, right? Um, yeah. And yeah, if that's better or not, I don't know. Um, but I do get the idea, right? So yeah. they moved everything into um, Intel IP, basically, um, and have everything under their yeah. control, which, which probably makes sense. Yeah. They also use binary data uh, binary data format, so it's, again, not JSON or no. XML or no. something like that. Not really readable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, XML can be also quite confusing anyway. Uh, so, yeah, and then we need the CPU. So the CPU has some cache already before um, the memory is available, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the AC RAM uh, Chris spoke about is basically um, placed inside this uh, CPU cache. Um, yeah, during early launch, um, the CPU passes a fit table, figures out where the ACM is, loads it into the cache, um, into the AC RAM location, which is shielded or protected, and then it does a verification of it. And after the signature verification is done, then it gets executed. And this is how basically um, how that works. And also CPU is quite important because a lot of registers in it, like MSR registers, mm -hmm. which are programmed by, uh, through the ACM. So the ACM is basically the core root of trust uh, code, uh, which is then um, doing all other or further steps. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think you can um, kind of um, interpret the ACM as like your, probably your trusted computing base, right? Because that's like the first real code, let's say, that runs there. Yeah. Um, of course, everything is closed source in NDA. I don't know if you want to have that as an PCG, but still, um, it's like the first real real code that, that runs and does the verification, right? Yeah. That's true. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, the Intel management engine we already talked about. So it's basically the Southbridge firmware. Nowadays, I guess it has eight megabytes, probably more firmware. Yeah, it depends, right? So there, there are different types of uh, so yeah, I mean, management engine is not management, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, there, there are multiple, let's say, versions for server, client, platforms, yeah. IoT. But let's say in general, they, they all have benefits, which basically means additional feature set. No. Like uh, for server space, they have monitoring features for, for the customer. Uh, for the client, uh, which means uh, desktop and mobile platforms, they have some kind of remote management and whatever. And it also is able to run Java virtual, so a Java virtual machine, so you can you know, load your own Java applets into the Intel management engine. It makes it probably 
Is, is that <laughs> this, this innovation engine that they talk about? No, 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 no. This is additional. So you have also no, no, no. Intel Innovation Engine, yeah. but it's a separate mm -hmm. part of it. Yeah. So it's it's a different story. But yeah. let's just concentrate on the Intel Management Engine. But it's Innovation Engine is an engine in the engine, right? Yeah. Which is, which is okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's and the Intel Management Engine is highly involved in all those platform security technologies from Intel. Yeah, um, as we said, it's it's basically part of the of yeah. the of trust. The firmware um, image from the ME is a separate ROM from the BIOS, and it has its own data partition inside. It's not only code, it's also integrated data partition. You can figure out there, there's a lot of research and reverse engineering um, um, regarding Intel ME. You can probably get some more information about it. And it also the most important thing, it has some kind of configuration inside the, uh, inside the data, so let's say data partition, mm -hmm. and it has um, the fuses, which are important for the security. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So for those who are wondering, I mean, there, I think there are a lot of talks about Intel uh, ME, right, what the management engine does and what not, and these kind of things. Um, out of an IVV perspective, basically, um, what you what you put in there is like all your hardware configuration, like I don't know what PCIe slots you have, what SATA slots and these kind of things, um, what should be done uh, if... Uh, I don't know if the machine boots up and you have boot guard enabled and then the keys are not correct and these kind of things, right? So yeah. there's actually a lot um, to configure there. And also that tooling is NDA and closed source. And um, I would probably say there are, I don't know, over 200 options or so for a normal platform that you have to configure in order to get it right. So um, the 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 space for errors is quite big there, I would say, yeah. right? So even we are dealing with that on, on a daily basis and uh, it's still very complicated. Yeah, that's completely true. Yeah, yeah. yeah the platform boot flow. So we will give you a um, rough overview of how it works. We can go into deep in detail in forty minutes. That's that's probably impossible. So even with with I guess six hours, it you have edge cases and things you can't cover. So it's a, a topic for multiple days. If you want to get more detailed information, please check out Tromo Hudson's blog about Bootguard. That, that's a good one. Yeah, then you get definitely more details from it. Um, in general, um, as we explained it before, um, the PCH maps firmware at reset vector, which is basically um, the BIOS firmware. CPU passes in the FIT uh, table, then it loads the ACM into a CRAM. Uh, it verifies and executes it. And the ACRAM does some platform checks, right? So it's basically security check, checks if it's production worthy or whatever, and um, figures out what's going on. Uh, you can see that in that uh, small uh, schematics there. It's it's not that complex. We already talked yeah. about. I mean, what how you can imagine that is basically when the PCA maps firmware at the reset vector means like the reset vector on, on uh, Intel x86 system is just below four gigabyte, right? Yeah. Like always. And what the PCH does, it maps your 16 MB or 32 MB, like in the last 16 MB or 32 MB of that uh, four gigabyte. Right? I guess it's only possible with 16. So there's some uh, hardware is, limit. Uh, or is it digital, digital, digital extended? Yeah, uh, so 16 was, I think, up to, uh, to Coffee Lake or so. Yeah. Um, but they extended that nowadays on the newer generation platforms. Uh, but still, OK, let's assume it's the last 16 MB of your, like, just below the 4, gig, 4 gigabyte, right? That's also why in the image that we put in there basically shows, uh, you have to imagine on the left-hand side, there is like 0 gigabyte, right? And on the on the right-hand side where the yeah. fit uh, is located, the fit point is located, that's 4 gigabyte. And that's also the reason why um, the BIOS has its own SPI driver. Because if it's more than 16 megabytes memory yeah. maps, then you need to have your SPI. Yeah, you really need to go through the SPI control actually to fetch more code. Yeah. 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 Um, the next part is that the ACM passes the fit, um, which is basically um, 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 there to, to figure out where the KM is located. So the KM and ACM are part of the BIOS firmware. So, and um, this is what it does. And then the ACM also reads the, the public key uh, hash from the Intel ME fuses, verifies the KM, passes its data, uh, uses the public key inside the KM to verify and load further technologies. Yeah. yeah, right? So, I mean, this is quite easy. It's just like a handover. The key manifest is more to make it flexible for multiple security technologies, but that's how it goes. And after that, Technologies like Intel Bootcamp comes into play. Yeah. So we will talk about it later. 
I mean, that's exactly that, that structure that we just talked about, right? Load the ACM first, verify that part, and then uh, check against the KM if that is the better part, you know, and from there you can actually take it and basically bury that that uh, trust into the CPU and the PCH, right? Yeah. Um, and then you have your, your setup ready to go um, and you have, you know that, that, that the KM that you actually loaded is valid, right? The ACM is valid and from there you can take it basically. Yeah. That's basically the same for, for all the uh, security technology that they have, right? Yeah, this is completely true. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So after that, that brief overview uh, on how uh, conversion security uh, works, basically, um, we can we can go a little bit more into into bootguard and trust execution technology, right? So that's uh, two of these inter technologies that they merge together, um, and we can we can skip a little bit through these um, to to get a better feeling on that. Uh, because that is that is the main topic of the talk here, basically. Um, so yeah, uh, I think two generations ago um, or three generations ago, Intel decided basically to merge and and uh, and yeah, start that strategy that you just talked about, right? And to merge uh, the first part was to merge Bootguard and TXT to TXT into one technology uh, because uh, yeah, all of, both of these technologies are based on ACMs um, and that you don't have like three ACMs to, to have both technology working, you only need two anymore, right? And they named it Converge Bootguard and TXT. So in the short form, it's CBNG. Um, pretty catch, catchy name if you uh, if you take it. And yeah, as I said, it contains uh, two technologies. It has Bootguard in there and it has trusted execution technology in there. Um, in the Bootguard, so both of these technologies have like a different purpose, right? So, yeah. and, and um, that also makes sense. Bootguard is... Um, it actually protects the first part of the code that you load, right, at the reset vector. Um, and um, TXT, on the other hand, um, is a trusted execution environment, right? Um, you have runtime measurements, so you have a DRTM instead of an SRTM. Um, do you probably want to explain what SRTM and DRTM is? Yeah, static root of trust for measurement is basically a thing where you have the, the BIOS code starting, measuring stuff into TPM. Mm -hmm. So it's a chain of trust down to the operating system. You measure our code before you load it and execute it. The so next code is measuring before it loads the next code um, and so on. And so it's static. If you're having something like DRTM, which is more like runtime measurements, you can just invoke uh, during runtime a secure code base or let's say secure trust anchor, which then does active measurements mm -hmm. of something. Yeah. Okay, and and uh, SRTM is always yeah, as the name already says, statically right from uh, basically from when when the CPU starts, you start your your chain of trust right all yeah. down to the operating system. DRTM can be invoked at any time. It's right? dynamic. Yeah. yeah, that's basically the D in the name. <laughs> that's basically the D in the name. Yeah, yeah. It also has some IOMMU protection mechanisms, and it's starting some something called measured launch environment. I don't want to get too, in, too deep into that. Um, but it's used in Windows 10 in device guard, for example. Um, so Windows 10 makes extensive uses of trusted execution environments, and Intel TXT is one of uh, those. Ah, all right. Yeah, um, yeah. and um, it's verified through the converged security technology nowadays. So TUNT um, exactly follows uh, the the scheme that you that you just uh, explained, basically. Um, and you have a couple of important. Things that you actually have there. Of course, you have the ME again, right? Or the the um, server part of the management engine. Um, you have a couple of firmware security headers. Of course, you got fit table as always. You got a KM as always. But this time, you also have BPM. Um, I think we will go into that later on. Um, we have an initial boot block, um, and uh, of course, you need, you need some BIOS, some BIOS <laughs> code, right? some BIOS UFI firmware code. Uh, I probably don't need it, but it would be better for some kind of technologies. So yeah, yeah. That's, also, if you want to put something in general, it would be nice. Yeah, yeah so for sure. Code. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, the intermediate management engine. Um, it basically. Um, so besides the 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 um, the fuses, the fuses, right? Mm -hmm. So the the hash of the public key. It also con uh, contains some configuration data, right? Um, you can actually configure. 
um, CBT or the bootcut part of CBT to run in, in, in different modes. So either it can be completely disabled, uh, we have it in verified or measure boot or basically in both, right? Yeah. Um, what you can also do is um, enable TXT or disable TXT. So even though they merge these technologies together, together you can still um, enable only one part of it, right? So if you only need the bootcut feature, uh, from CBNT, just enable boot guard and off you go, right? If you yeah. only need TXT feature of that uh, of CBNT, only enable TXT and off you go. And that also that all of these things are actually uh, put into the internal management engine, right? Yeah. Um, and it also contains um, what to do if an error occurs when you actually start a boot guard, right? Um, so imagine if you start your system um, and basically. Uh, you don't start the code that you expect to start, right? So the measurements are wrong. Um, what are you doing, right? Yeah. Um, do you do nothing? So basically you say, okay, I don't care. Uh, I got a remote station later on. Um, <laughs> why then having boot guard at all? But okay. Uh, but for debugging purposes, so for example, that's quite nice. Uh, you can shut down immediately, which is you don't get your computer on anymore. Um, or you can say, okay, you got X seconds or minutes uh, to actually yeah. solve the problem so that you get some boot card, uh, some the debug output. The funny part is that this error enforcement policy is one of the dangerous things they ever introduced because there's the do nothing option. <laughs> <laughs> and some yeah. vendors already configured the do nothing option, so the security is basically not there. Yeah. I mean, for remote station, a measure boot feature would be enough. So you can uh, then it's uh, it's basically also the question if you want to shut down the platform. Normally, a measure boot is not enforcing, which is quite good. And so um, yeah, 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 that makes sense. Yeah, and that's also one one of our our, our key things here. Um, these configurations are quite opaque, right? So no one knows what you really configured there. Um, so they don't put like stickers on top. Yes, we have to do nothing enabled. Don't worry, right? That's the thing. Um, yeah, what's the initial boot block? Um, yeah, as I already said, it's the first code that is loaded um, as part of your firmware code. Um, it con can consist of multiple sections, so that doesn't mean um, it oh, it does not have one have to be one sequential part of binary code in your firmware, right? So it can be at different places, and your firmware actually loads different parts of that code, right? So um, that means um, this initial boot block basically is defined in the BPM, right? And there you can actually define multiple IBBs, like initial boot blocks and not only one, obviously, but which, which makes sense. Um, and the idea of these IBBs is um, that before the firmware starts, um, these parts already, already get measured into the TPM, right? Yeah, and um, they're basically verified like in a secure boot or verified boot environment, right? So, so they use those sections defined in the BPM. They also have uh, uh, multiple hashes with different crypto algorithms, which is the final hash. And then they calculate um, the, all those IBBs together and get a final hash. And if that matches the BPM, you can say you're good to go. Um, yeah, that's how it works. Yeah. And additionally to that, you can also the ACM also measures it into the TPM if you activate it, measure boot basically yeah. in the in, into the management engine yeah. options for okay. later use uh, on a remote station or if you want to just have your your measurement log, right? Yeah. These kind of things makes sense. Uh, yeah, and basically the core part here is that boot policy manifest. Um, it enforces the boot policy, which is passed by the ACM. Um, you can configure multiple protections and platform features in that. Um, I think we also in the demo later on, um, we can go a little bit through like what kind of options do you have there. Um, as we already said, it defines IBBs and also the expected hash values for these IBBs. Um, and it's signature protected, right? And that, that hash of that public key who, um, where the private key actually signed that BPM, that hash, is in the KM, right? And that is how we extend the chain because yeah. KM is already verified by ACM. So, you know, that is vetted in, in, in TIGER basically. Um, and in that KM, there are hashes of the public key of the BPM. And with that uh, public key, you can actually verify the signature of the BPM, right? Um, so that is how you, how you extend your chain there also through the BPM. Um, and again, it's binary data format, no XML, JSON. <laughs> I, think, I think that's for nearly all the structures which are in firmware. Yeah, um, that's true. Not that. um, yeah, and the last last part is uh, the BIOS UFI firmware code, um, oh, yeah. which you need 
you can find a great source how we did it implement that because it's open. So we um, implemented it as part of the Cobut project for customers, yeah. and you can find it. It's basically to report CBNT errors and statuses, but it's also there for the initializing the dynamic route of trust for measurements because it's an additional ACM for the operating systems hypervisor. Yeah. So um, you need to load an additional ACM which is signed by Intel at runtime inside the operating system or before the operating system inside the bootloader. Um, and um, so where you can build out, uh, can build up your, your dynamic route of trust for yeah. measurement. Right. Yeah. You have exactly two ACMs for CBNT, right? So the first one is a startup ACM, which uh, gets loaded before all the other firmware code uh, gets loaded, right? And it verifies exactly what you said, right? Uh, against the ME fuses, it verifies the KM and these kind of things. And you have the s ACM, which is there for the DRTM um, later on, which you are now loading in T-Boot, for example. Yeah, that's, that's correct. correct. Ah. All right. Um, so we sketched a little bit uh, the inter cvt boot flow here. Um, as, um, yeah, basically it's the same, it's a little bit, or it's, it's similar to what, what we do with the KM. So the ACM first verifies, or first loads, and then verifies the BPM. So it does check if the, if the hash of the, of the public key um, of the BPM is actually in the KM, and if it's the same. Um, if that is correct and verified, it, it parses the BPM, then it looks for these IBB sections, which are defined in that BPM, because it knows the BPM is valid and can be trusted. Um, it looks for these IBB sections and calculate, um, calculates the hash value of these sections in firmware, right? Um, so the final hash, it's just one hash, so it's basically hash together. Yeah, right, the final hash uh, of these all these sections, and then it compares what it's calculated on it on its own on, on the actual firmware with what should it be, um, which is defined in the BPM, right? And if these uh, hash values are equal, um, it knows, all right, um, everything's fine. Um, my my IBB is still what I expect it to be, basically. And then it hands off to the reset vector, and off you go. Yeah. If it's not uh, if it's not valid or can't be verified, it will directly, as we say, shut down or shut down uh, after a specific amount of time. Yeah, and that's it. Or do nothing if you put in do nothing. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. that, <doesn't... laughs> that is true. Okay, right. so we come to the more interesting topic. I would say uh, we explain a lot of information regarding inter-security technologies. Um, so we have something called Converge Security Suite. Huh? That's um, something we developed. Um, some time ago, so two years ago, we started with it, basically. Um, so we, until then, we were running graphical tools, Intel tools, yeah, basically, under Ryan. Um, it's not only Intel, it's also AMD and other companies. So, and it was really a horrible user experience. I and can imagine, yeah. <laughs> the problem is also, how do you automate that if it's a graphical user interface? How do you do automation with some kind of automatic signing processes and whatever? It's, it's, just, it's just 2022, right? So <laughs> that's, that's how the world works. Yeah, not, not for the software vendors. <laughs> yeah, probably not. Yeah. So, um, and there was also no testing available for the operating system. So you could test um, inside the UFI shell with the UFI firmware, but you always had to restart. Mm. You have to execute it inside the shell and somehow load it. I mean, it's possible, but it's really horrible interfacing. It's complicated and it's it's not really, why, why don't you do that in the operating system? Works still fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you probably you have to, to set some specific options for the kernel or create an ISO image, which can do that. Yeah. But why do we need a UFI shell for that? Yeah, and so, and it's, it also means it only supports UFI, right? Yeah. So if you have anything else like like open source firmware, like Cobol or these kind of things, you're out of the game because, yeah. Uh, or you have to load Tiano Core yeah. then. All those tools, even the, the graphical tools for, for creating those manifests like VPM and KM, we're completely UEFI centric. So yeah. it's just like not really cool. So short story, we started on our, our own. Um, yeah, so basically the Converge Security Suite, you can find it on GitHub. Um, it's open source tooling for platform security features. At the moment, we support Intel and AMD um, uh, platform security features. AMD is currently, let's say, work in progress, but they already started with it. Um, yeah, it's firmware agnostic. We don't care about firmware, so just give us an image. And so all those technology headers and whatever is completely agnostic from, from, from the firmware which is used, uh, even if it's Corbu, DFI, Slimboard Load, or whatever. Uh, so that's not a problem for our suite. Um, it can be used for provisioning, which is more important for the ODMs or IBVs like us. 
um, which means firmware images provisioning, creating those manifests, and so on. Uh, testing for runtime testing, which is really nice if you can, for example, do TX, into TXT runtime mm -hmm. verification, so if the TXT implementation is correct, and but also binary testing, research and security audits are also really important. Yeah. So um, this is where it's basically used. I mean, we started from the testing part, right? So yeah. that's that's where we came from, right? Uh, yeah. So we had to check if all the TXT features uh, are actually there and available, and from there it just evolved because then we noticed, okay, uh, we actually, it's not how it should be, and now we want to provision our own platform, and there's also no tooling, right? Yeah. And the fun part now is um, we can do everything with UFI because, like, we include UFI. However, it doesn't work the other way around, right? The, yeah. Like the open source firmware image images do not work in Windows tooling, for example. Yeah. Those kind of things. Yeah, so that's correct. Um, funny part is we are BSD three license, so um, that's quite good. We are hosted on GitHub, written, written in pure Golang, which is really great that's because nice. we don't have C dependencies or whatever. Yeah. You can, in theory, we can run the tool we wrote or some tools you can run on Windows as well. So we didn't do that until now, but probably someone want to go for it because for us Linux was more important. We use a file system parser called Fiano, which is really nice because it should implement all firmware file systems. Um, which are basically not really well known. So check it out, please. Um, it's really nice. I added some reference later on. Um, we also, have, so at the moment, we have support for CBT provisioning, for TXT provisioning, for TXT testing at runtime, mm -hmm. and we have a PCR zero diagnostics tool. So the most people don't know, but the TPM PCR zero is basically calculated from specific type of of um, of, of code and manifest and whatever. Uh, from those binary images, so it's really and from runtime information, so it's really complicated to do that. That's why we have those tools in there. Pointle and AMD. Yeah, that's, right. I mean that's especially nice if you if you want to check PCR zero, right? I mean that's like the most important one, yeah. basically. Um, if you want to see, okay, what does the ACM measures here, and if you want to do some pre-calculation and all these kind of things, uh, PCR zero is actually the the register that you're looking for, and um, yeah, it's it's important that you know what, what's going on there. Basically, I think um, we also have boot guard provisioning on the way, at least. Okay, um, that is uh, that is I I used it already. Yeah. I'd say like that, but it's not production worthy. Uh, right? It's so, not production worthy yet, yeah. um, and not all NDAs are cleared. But it's on the way. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, aside from that, how did we make it public, even with NDA? So first of all, there are tons of official public code documentation from Intel. So you can find it. It's hard to find, but you can find it. Yeah. And they already pub, um, made a lot of code public. So we only had some parts which were hard to figure out, which we used try and error methods to, to uh, get, uh, get um, some information out of this, like key generation, signal generation, hash calculation, and firmware platform configurations, basically boot code build and brick and yeah. do that for a long time. So it's really, it's exhausting. It takes a lot of resources and it's painful. But we did it. So, and what we all did for for structures which, not, which can be public, we really, uh, renamed them all to reserved. This is a standard way in Intel data sheets, but it's under one person, I would say, also of our code base, which is fine. Yeah. I guess it only um, has problem with Intel PFR, which is not really public yet. Yeah. So, but yeah, this is kind of cool. Yeah, I think we we did a pretty good job there on finding all these uh, public code and documentation, right? On on different. I think we used yeah. eight or ten different repos, um, and there were some some structures here and some structures there. And actually, sometimes I know field A and B were uh, publicly available, but on the other repo, field field A and B were reserved, right? So they're not publicly known. But you got field C and so we mixed it all together and basically um, got like the, the the biggest common nanner uh, of all these uh, things out there. Um, and yeah, so that way we could actually make it public because it all was already public, yeah. uh, but we had to gather the information and that that uh, was actually quite quite a lot of work. That's that's true. But the good thing is Intel is going into more open direction for uh, yeah. for for firmware security or hardware security technologies. Yeah. I think this will change in, in, in later, and it would be good if we can show them that we have a cool converged security suite which is public and can be everywhere integrated. Yeah, and uh, also to mention, I mean, we work with Intel engineers together on these kind of yeah, things for sure. Um, so that is uh, uh, that is also we have a good working relationship with them, and um, yeah, they helped us out here and there. So that's that's cool stuff. 
Yeah, so what's the roadmap um, for the future? So we want to have basically more AMD tooling. So AMD has similar stuff, um, uh, which needs to be passed, for example, AMD uh, PSP provisioning, AMD file system support, all that strange things. We have Intel PFR, which is not yet, uh, there yet. Uh, we, want, we want also to implement a CBNT test suite. Um, I think this is not done yet, but will probably um, uh, happen later or sooner, depending on how much pressure we get from the customer side as well. But uh, we also have already some other companies working on, on our code tree, so it's not like we are alone. Yeah. Um, yeah, we want to do Linux distro packages integration. Probably someone wants to do Windows as well. I'm open for it. Totally. Um, and we will move all file, film by file system related packages to Fiano. So please check it out, which is a nice Golang yeah. library for firmware parsing. I think we already moved a lot of stuff over, right? But it's not complete yet. Right? Yeah, not yeah. complete yet. So, and next we have a short demonstration. I guess we're running out of time, but yes. um, um, however, we still like to show you a little bit on what we did um, and, and how you can use it, right? Um, so I already cloned uh, the repo um, in, into, our, into our Go source folder. Uh, what you have here is like our, our normal structure of the directory and in the command folder, you can find uh, a couple of tools, right? So we got the CBT provisioning tool, we got the PCR zero tool, we got the TXT provisioning tool, and the TXT test suite. Um, all right, uh, we could probably start with the CBT provisioning tool. Um, you just type go build, and it builds it. Um, and you got the CBT provisioning tool here, which you can run on the command line. Um, it gives you a couple of options that you can use. Um, yeah, I have, let me check it out. I have um, I have some demo folder made up, um, which I have to jump over. Um, there you got the CBT provisioning tooling that I just uh, that I just built. And we got two images. We got a UFI image and we got a COVID image, right? So it doesn't matter which one to show. Um, so we just go for, let's say the UFI image. Uh, oops. Um, and what it gives you, uh, so let's let's move to the top here. Um, you know, oh my, so as you see, it's a lot of information. Um, so first of all, it prints you like the whole fit table that you have, um, which is uh, which is that one here. Um, it it gives you like what type of entry do you have? Uh, we got the header entry first of all. We got uh, I don't know micro trade updates. We got a couple of skip entry entries. Um, we got the startup ACM, right? We got uh, a couple of other ACMs here, and we got a couple of um, legacy policy records. Even though it's it's uh, it's for the CBNT platform, um, OEMs and uh, tend to include everything they have basically, um, just to be feature complete. However, um, the we always um, we always do these sections here um, with the with the with the four dashes, um, and there comes the boot policy manifest. Um, within the boot policy manifest, you have a couple of structures, right? First of all, you have the header. Uh, we have like signature and revision and these kind of things in there. And then we have the most um, inter inter uh, interesting part is uh, actually segment elements uh, part. So that is where your IBBs um, are defined later on, right? Um, here is also the, the hash value that you can expect later on. Um, that gets measured into, um, or should, should have get measured uh, into the TPM. Um, and you can also define a couple of IBB segments um, as shown here, um, which, which the ACM then should measure, right? And these are exactly the parts that we talked about, um, which the ACM looks into the BPM um, and gets these IBB segments and measures all these parts from the firmware into uh, into the TPM, for example, or at least measure hash them all together and um, compares the, the calculated hash values of these IBB segments um, with, the, with the hash values here uh, on top. And if they're equal, um, everything's fine and they move on. Right. Yeah. You also have tons of other options. I guess that would be too much for now because yeah. we're already running out of time. Yeah, so, yeah. And we could also show how you provision it, but it's all also documented in, in the GitHub repository so you can figure out everything yourself. The TXT3 tooling you can also execute on your own laptop and yeah. figure out if your TXT uh, compliant is very strict. So it's probably showing errors even if you have a UFI which supports into TXT. 
which is really nice. Yeah. yeah. But aside from that, that's how it works. You can see the KM, the BPM, and the fit table. Um, so and also its signatures and so on. Yeah. So I think this is also quite helpful. I think so too. Um, so that is the KM part here. Um, also, you have like general information here on top, and then that is exactly um, the the um, the hash of the of the public key part of the signing key of the BPM, right? And that is exactly in here. Um, so that is how how you extend the chain, um, and it also um, if you print something like I think it's KM show or so. Yeah, this is a data section uh, of the KM. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, <laughs> and it's a UFI image, right? So it's a little bit. A little yeah, so key. vendor section, yeah. which additional, I don't know, data or whatever, which. Yeah. So you can also only part, uh, only show like the KM part and the BPM part. Um, you can also extract it if you want to. Um, uh, you can also stitch like new BPMs in there. Um, you can sign an, an BPM. You can create uh, or generate an, an, an BPM file based on the JSON configuration and these kind of things, right? So you can use that preview, uh, the tool for just checking out what's in in the firmware, but also extracting everything from the firmware, provisioning everything, changing, stitching, all these kind of things that you probably need. Um, yeah. All right, and the other thing uh, that we can show is the probably the the, the test suite, right? The TXT one. Um, we don't have a TXT system, um, yeah. so yeah. So it will give us a lot of errors. However, just that you um, that you see um, how you can uh, how you can do it. Ooh, uh, uh, I get to execute tests, right? Yeah. And there you get, uh, we have like 75 tests implemented right now. Um, and a lot of these fail on these machines, obviously, um, because we don't have, uh, we don't have a TPM, for example. Um, yeah. But that is on a normal system, you would, you could check, okay, uh, all these rules are actually in place um, and are we compliant to the, to the TXT spec, right? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. Can you switch to the presentation yes. again? That would be helpful. Okay, thank you. So I've only the last two slides. I need to speed up. Thank you. Uh, call to action. Yeah, join us at the open source firmware Slack, uh, slack.osfw.dev. Uh, we have the Convert Security channel. Um, please also get uh, in contact with us through GitHub. So if you have code ideas or bugs, just publish, yeah. uh, or let's say make a pull request or whatever. Be open for everything and spread the word, especially for ODMs like Quanta or Vistran. And also for firmware security pen tester, which also might um, yeah, be interested in that. Yeah, that might be it. Yeah. Oh, does it work? This is the last slide. No, not really, but I think it broke. OK. So it um, looks like the keyboard went out of battery. That's <laughs> perfect. And it's not even live, right? Yeah. <laughs> I just attached the public resources at the end, just figures it out. And yeah, thanks for listening and joining us um, for the talk. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, have fun with the remaining talks uh, on the Open Source Summit. And yeah, get in contact with us if you want to know more about the Converge Security Suite or any inter-security related things, problems whatsoever. Uh, I think we can help you out. See you. See you.